This is part two of the sequence, Christian Satan. Part one elucidated the utter lack of ties between the fallen angels from the book of Enoch and Genesis 6, Lucifer and Satan. And I also pointed out the ludicrous manipulation of Isaiah 14 by the Christian patriarchy. This part is a continuation to the dissection of the Christian Satan, and will analyze the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, since it has also been misinterpreted by the church to create an irrelevant story for Satan. We will begin by listening to the chapter and my comments. The word of the Lord came to me again. Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of gods, in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man, and not a God. Okay, so from the beginning, Yahweh makes obvious that he's addressing a man. Let's continue. Though you set your heart as the heart of a god, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom in trade, you have increased your riches, and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. I mean, unless you believe Satan owns treasuries of gold and silver because of a business in trade, this wouldn't work for you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Because you have set your heart as the heart of a god, Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Last time I checked, Satan doesn't die in the midst of any sea after being attacked by foreign nations. In fact, I don't think he's supposed to die at all, if he's going to burn in hell for eternity. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a god? But you shall be a man, and not a god, in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens. For I have spoken. So here, Yahweh clarifies again that he's addressing a man, and also curses him to die a dishonorable death at the hands of foreigners. Not going good for Satan's squad so far. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Okay, so all it needs is some common sense, some vigilance, and a touch of education to notice that the Garden of Eden, which is in Ur, modern-day Iraq, and the Mountain of God, which is in Sinai, Egypt, are two distant and different places that were never called residence for neither the king of Tyre nor the Satan in Christian lore. This is another clear example of the methods of comparison that the Bible uses, and here it figuratively describes the life of bliss that Ethobal III led before his demise. As for the ten precious stones and the cherub who covers mentioned here, I will delineate later. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways. From the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. 
Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Here, Yahweh mentions again how trade and riches contributed to the corruption of the king of Tyre. But here we see more interesting details, like how the king defiled his sanctuaries, and how Yahweh makes everyone gaze at his destruction, with astonishment. Just like in the demise of the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face, towards Sidon, and prophesy against her, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I execute judgments in her, and am hallowed in her. For I will send pestilence upon her, and blood in her streets, the wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them, who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. But anyhow, let's finally examine the context of the chapter. In the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, Yahweh instructs the prophet Ezekiel to pass his warnings to the king of Tyre, the neighboring city of Sidon, and prophesied the restoration of Israel. Historically speaking, Sidon and Tyre were major centers for trade and commerce in the Levantine region for centuries on end. Their arts and craftsmanship were famous and in great demand. So much so that the ancient poet Homer praised the crafts of Sidon and King David called Tyre the richest of nations in his 45th Psalm. For that reason, King David and his son Solomon had an alliance with Tyre, and Tyre transported the wood and builders needed in Jerusalem for the construction of the great Jewish temple. I will put all the biblical references regarding the might and fame of Tyre and its relationship with Israel in the description box. So knowing this, let's take a look at the verses manipulated by the Christian leadership. We see the recurring character, the cherub who covers, or the covering cherub. But who is the covering cherub, and why is he named this way? First of all, the only passages in the entire Bible that mention covering cherubs are the ones about the Ark of the Covenant, where cherubs of gold were made to cover the Ark with their wings. Second, nowhere in the Old Testament is Satan referred to as a covering cherub, as he had no such task of covering anything nor was he mentioned as a cherub to begin with. Now let's move on to the other problem, where Christians get the notion of Satan being made of ten precious stones. If you open the chapter right before Ezekiel 28, the problem is solved. The 22nd verse of Ezekiel 27 states that Tyre was trading all kinds of precious stones and gold with other merchants, meaning they were famous for these commodities, and so it is natural for the king to bask in this enormous state of wealth. So to sum up this whole Satan story in Christianity, it is a complete and utter disaster in the logical sense as much as it is in the biblical sense, which is the case for most Christian literature. It is another mixed and fabricated story that resulted in more panic and superstition in the religious world than there already was and is. So this is it for the Christian Satan sequence. There are many more pressing subjects that I will address in the future, given the chance. Till next time.